I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present and the elders from other communities who might be here with us today. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Tom Heyman. Tom's done his PhD uh, in my laboratory. Um, I have to say it's not been a straightforward project. There are some PhD projects that go like a dream. This one did not. But I <laughs> and I think it's a credit to Tom um, that he's persisted with it and I think also a credit to his resilience as well as his um, scientific um, credibility as well. Uh, as you'll see, um, it really refutes something that's sort of been uh, in the literature for a long time. And I think these types of studies are just as important as the ones that show us something new. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Tom. Thanks, Sandra. Today I'm going to talk to you about the main project that I've been working on throughout my PhD, where I've shown that contrary to the widely established literature, that Riplet and not Trim25 is required for an endogenous regard-dependent antiviral response. So viral infections are a significant global health issue with seasonal outbreaks of influenza to the millions of people living with hepatitis B and C and HIV AIDS. And it's critical that we have uh, underlying understanding of the fundamental way our bodies fight off viral infections so we can discover and develop new treatments to prevent viruses. So our innate immune system is our first line of defense against viral infection. Different classes of virus contain different nucleic components in their genome that are released into cells during infection. And the host cell pattern recognition receptors of the innate immune system can recognize these non-self invaders and initiate an innate immune response to combat the infection. Pattern recognition receptors vary based on their cellular location and recognize viruses based on genomic class. For instance, toll-like receptors are transmembrane sensors of DNA and RNA viruses. Rigai-like receptors are cytosolic sensors of RNA viruses. And the cyclic GMP AMP synthases are cytosolic sensors of DNA viruses. So I'll be focusing on the Rigai-like receptors today and specifically on Rigai itself. Rigai contains two card signaling domains, a central helicase domain and a C-terminal domain. And together, the helicase and C-terminal domain recognize and bind viral RNA. Rigai is critical for the detection and control of single-stranded RNA viruses, such as influenza A virus, rabies virus, Ebola virus, and Sendi virus, but also double-stranded RNA viruses. There's uh, some dispute in the literature as to the specific ligand that Rigai recognizes, but it's accepted that the RNA, uh, that a 5' triphosphate cap is required for Rigai to distinguish self from non self. Um, and it can respond to double stranded RNAs, defective interfering RNAs, such as those produced when Sendi virus replicates, as well as viral genomic panhandle RNAs. So, this is an overview of an influenza A viral infection of a cell. So upon being endocytosed into the cell, pH gradient in the endosome causes disassembly of the virus and release of its uh, components into the cytoplasm. And here, viral RNAs and proteins form a complex that's shuttled to the nucleus. Um, this results in subsequent RNA replication and mRNA synthesis leading to protein production um, and the subsequent spread of the viral infection. Riga is able to recognize the viral RNAs produced in this process. And once it does this, it undergoes a conformational change that allows it to become active and interact with its downstream adapter, the mitochondrial antiviral signaling protein, or MAVs. MAVs activation causes subsequent signaling through downstream pathways uh, 
uh, NF-kappa B and IF3 and 7 pathways, leading to the transcription of a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, including type 1 and type 3 interferons. And it's these interferons that are really critical for the control of the virus because they're able to bind their receptors on the infected and surrounding cells and induce interferon receptor signaling. Um, and this leads to upregulation of a whole host of interferon-stimulated genes um, to combat the infection, and RIGI itself is upregulated as an ISG. So as you can imagine, tight regulation of this inflammatory response is critical because underactivation of the innate immune system can lead to the host succumbing to infection, whereas overactivation can be debilitating and lead to a number of pro-inflammatory disorders. And as you can imagine, RIGI itself is tightly regulated, and this is predominantly through uh, phosphorylation and ubiquitination. RIGI is held in an autorepressed state um, in the steady state in cells by phosphorylation at a number of key residues. And upon binding viral RNA, it undergoes a robust dephosphorylation event um, and a conformational change leading to the exposure of its card signaling domains. And this conformational change also allows access to RIGI by the E3 ligases Riplet and Trim25 which provide activating K63-linked ubiquitin chains, um, and TRIM25 has also been shown to be able to provide non-covalently linked stabilizing ubiquitin to RIGI. There's a second layer of regulation where these activating K63-linked ubiquitin chains are removed from RIGI by deubiquitinating enzymes, as well as E3 ligases attaching K48-linked chains, which are degradation signals to downregulate RIGI. The key step in RIGI activation is formation of a tetramer, and RIGI does this through its card domains. And here you can see a crystal structure of that RIGI tetramer with the card domains shown in blue and pink. And you can see, uh, in this case, it's stabilized by non-covalently attached ubiquitin molecules. The RIGI tetramer is then able to interact with MAVs and cause MAVs aggregation, which is what propagates the downstream signal. And TRIM25 is published to be the E3 ligase that provides this activating ubiquitin to RIGI. TRIM25 contains an N-terminal ring domain, which confers its E3 ligase activity two B-box domains, the function of which is relatively unknown, a coil-coil dimerization domain, and a C-terminal price bry domain. And the price bry domain is what allows TRIM25 to bind to the RIGI cards to target its substrate RIGI um, for ubiquitination. And this is a crystal structure showing the coil-coil dimer of TRIM25, which is, a, um, yeah, the coil-coil dimer of TRIM25. TRIM25 can also dimerize through its ring domain, so it's thought to be able to form high, uh, slightly higher order, order molecules as well. And this is what is generally accepted in the, rig, in the literature for TRIM25's mechanism of action on RIGI, whereby through its price bry domain, it can recruit the RIGI card domains um, and recruit an E2 ligase through its ring domain and thus ubiquitinate the RIGI cards, um, activating RIGI. So I've got this slide here for a couple of reasons. First, to show that TRIM25 has been published to be absolutely critical for RIGI signaling. And these are high-level publications with a high number of citations. And the second reason why I've got this here is to show that a number of the same people have been involved in many of the publications of TRIM25 and have used the same techniques to investigate uh, its mechanism of action. So there's very little data done in knockout, uh, TRIM25 knockout cell lines, and none done in TRIM25 knockout mice in the context of a viral infection. But this, these are uh, figures from the original Nature paper describing TRIM25 showing uh, 
MEFs that have been infected with Sendi, Sendi virus, which is a rigi specific virus. And when you knock out TRIM25, you completely reduce interferon beta um, compared to wild type in response to the virus. And they didn't look at viral levels of Sendi virus, but they did look at viral levels of v, uh, uh, VSV, where they showed an increase in virus in the TRIM25 knockouts. So this is uh, from a more recent paper which knocked out TRIM25 using CRISPR-Cas9 in 293T cells. And what they showed after an influenza A viral infection was an apparent increase of the viral protein NS1 in the TRIM25 knockouts when compared to wild type. Um, however, they didn't show any of the interferon response comparing wild type to knockouts in this paper. So there have been some inconsistencies lately in the literature around TRIM25. So this is a paper on Riplet. Um, and in this experiment, they took Riplet knockout, or they knocked out a number of uh, genes using CRISPR in 293T cells and infected them with Sendi virus and looked at rigi activation by looking at MAVs aggregation, which is the adapter downstream of rigi. And they did this using a semi de ring gel. And you can see in the Riplet knockout, you completely lose MAVs aggregation, but not in the TRIM25 knockout. And um, this is the same with uh, signaling downstream of MAVs. Um, so there's been a couple of problems with the, uh, the way experiments have been done in the TRIM25 literature. So firstly, MEF, TRIM25 knockout MEFs have been shown to have a growth defect compared to wild type MEFs. But probably more importantly, most of the functional analysis of TRIM25 has been done in overexpression uh, reporter systems. So the main assay that has been used is a Lysiferase reporter assay where the rig eye two cards alone have been overexpressed and the two cards are no longer auto-repressed by the rest of rig eye, so are able to signal by themselves. And in this experiment, when you increase overexpression of TRIM25, you specifically increase activation of the rig eye cards as measured by interferon beta luciferase uh, promoter activity. So at this point, I'd just like to point out quickly that TRIM25 has a number of other cellular roles. It was first identified as estrogen-responsive finger protein, um, and deletion of TRIM25 led to an underdeveloped uteri in knockout mice. It's been implicated in cell cycle and cancer. Um, it's a 14.33 binding protein and upregulated in a number of cancers. It's also an RNA binding protein, um, and recently, a couple of years ago, it has been shown to have a rig independent antiviral effect where it specifically targets influenza A viral ribonuclear proteins to block the onset of RNA chain elongation, thus inhib inhibiting the replication of the virus. So Riplet, the other E3 ligase, has sort of taken a back seat in terms of focused, rich, uh, focused research when compared to TRIM25. Um, it was discovered later or described later. And it has a very similar domain architecture to TRIM25. Uh, it contains a ring domain, a coil coil domain, and price spry domains. It, the only thing it lacks are the B box domains, and that makes it a little bit shorter. So the initial publication describing Ripplet showed a very robust phenotype uh, in knockout mice after infection with a rig eye specific virus that showed a decreased percentage of survival in the Riplet knockouts compared to wild type. They also looked at knockout MEFs um, infected with a couple of different rigi specific viruses as well as a rigi specific RNA ligand and showed that the Riplet knockout MEFs are no longer able to produce interferon beta in response to these rigi specific stimuli. So my project initially began trying to characterize the interaction uh, functionally between the TRIM25 price spray domain and the rig eye card domains. 
Um, and I started off using the overexpression systems commonly used in the literature, and it became increasingly clear they weren't a good way at looking at this pathway. Um, I saw a lot of overexpression artifacts, and you really needed to push the systems and optimize them to show you what you wanted to see. Um, so I, I decided to use a CRISPR-Cas9 strategy um, and delete Trim25, Rigai, and Riplet from a lung epithelial adenocarcinoma cell line. Um, and so I designed, I used a lenti viral system to deliver Cas9 or um, guides that were doxinducible to the ex first exons of the three proteins and then used docs to induce the deletion. Um, and you can see here for guide one, a nice loss of the Trim25 specific antibody band. And I have done experiments with a second Trim25 guide that I'm not gonna talk about today. But they show the same thing. Um, I also deleted Rigai, and I'll show Western blots on the next slide, and Riplet. And I haven't had a good antibody for Riplet, but recently Tanya from the lab has just done next-gen sequencing, which showed a 99 percentage of indels for the Riplet guide one. And I'd just like to point out quickly that my Trim25 knockouts uh, grew normally as, as wild types over a seven-day period. So working with these knockout cell lines and looking at these proteins endogenously, it became increasingly clear that Riplet, but not Trim25 deletion, impairs the Rigai antiviral response. And we're cu currently responding to reviewers' comments to our manuscript on this, um, and I'd just like to go through the data from that manuscript now. So in this uh, experiment, I took my Rigai, Trim25, and Riplet cell lines, uh, two guides for the Riplet cell lines, and induced deletion of the proteins using doxycycline and then infected them with PR8, which is a lab-adapted strain of H1N1. So upon infection, these cells produce interferon, which then are able to bind the interferon receptors, and downstream of these receptors, JAK-STAT signaling occurs. Importantly, in this case, a phosphorylation of STAT1. And you can see that nicely here. In the Rigai wild-type cells, we get robust phosphorylation of STAT1. When we knock out Rigai, you see a really nice loss of phosphostat-1, as well um, as loss. So I'd just like to point out that we also get upregulation of ISGs, including Rigai, Trim25, and stat-1, and we get a loss of these ISGs when we delete Rigai as well. We also lose phosphostat-1 in the Riplet knockouts, but not at all in the Trim25 knockouts. And as you would expect, this is uh, an ELISA for interferon lambda done on soups from the same samples. And you can see a nice induction of interferon lambda um, after infection, which is completely lost um, when you knock out Rigai and Riplet, but not Trim25. And I'd just like to point out that interferon lambda is the primary interferon response in these A549 cells and interferon beta is uh, not really detectable. So one thing we wanted to do was look at the interferon response in these cells more globally to see if there were any situations uh, where Trim25 was important for it. Um, and we did this using mass spectrometry and a global proteomic approach on infected A549 cell lysates. So what you're looking at here are volcano plots showing uh, a fold change in the protein ratio between wild type and knockout cells, um, with each point indica indicating a separate protein. The, the green dots are proteins with at least a four-fold change, and the red uh, dots have a two-fold change. So I've just uh, highlighted a few of the most differentially expressed uh, proteins detected. And you can see in Rigai and Riplet knockouts, 
you get a decrease in all your typical interferon-stimulated genes, including STAT1, MX1, IFIT proteins. Um, and in TRIM25, while there are a few uh, proteins differentially regulated, none of these are interferon-stimulated genes. And having a look at them, none of them appear to be involved in uh, viral infections. So this is just a heat map of all the ISGs detected in these samples as determined by the interferome database. And you can see that in Rigi and Riplet knockout cells, there's a massive decrease. Um, whereas in TRIM25 cells, they are um, not statistically different to wild type in any of these cases. So surprisingly, we didn't see any change in virus despite this complete loss of interferon signaling. And this is kind of unexpected uh, and not, yeah, this is kind of unexpected. So we detected all of the influenza A viral proteins in these samples. But as you can see, none of them were really different when you compare knockout to wild type. So a collaborator of ours, Michelle at the Hudson Institute, did some plaque assays for us. And plaque assays are sort of the gold standard of looking at virus. And they show you the exact viral titer that's present in your samples. And in our TRIM25 uh, knockouts, we don't see any change. And once again, in our rig eye knockouts, despite loss of interferon, we also don't see any difference in virus. So A549 cells are a cancer cell line that have been widely used in labs but have been in culture for a very long time. And we were wondering whether there was some inherent deficiency in their ability to respond to viral infections. So we wanted to look at a more maybe natural epithelial cell type. And collaborators of ours, Alan and Phil, at the Hunter Medical Research Institute have established in their lab uh, that they've got established work looking at primary human lung epithelial cells, but also what they call minimally immortalized um, epithelial cells. And these BCI NS1.1 cells are bronchial epithelial cells transformed with a human telom telomerase, and they were obtained from healthy individuals. And importantly, they've been published to retain the same characteristics as their primary cells. Um, as well as multipotent differentiation capabilities. So Alan used an SARNA knockdown approach to look at rig eye and trim 25 um, in these cells. And as you can see, and he used a human uh, virulent strain of H1N1 to infect them. And as you can see, you do get a significant increase in virus when you knock down uh, rig eye but you don't really see this when you knock down TRIM25. And this is mirrored in the interferon signaling where he looked at interferon beta and lambda, where you see a loss of interferon um, when you knock down rig eye, but not when you knock down TRIM25. So he also overexpressed TRIM25 in these cells as overexpression is the most commonly used system in the literature to look at TRIM25. And while you don't see a difference in virus or interferon beta, he did see a slight increase in interferon lambda um, as a result of TRIM25 overexpression. So these are Western blots from similar experiments where you can see the nocta, uh, you can compare infected versus uninfected cells with rig eye knockdown, TRIM25 knockdown, or rig eye and trim 25 knockdown together. And you can see that the knockdown efficiencies are quite modest, but you still get reduction in signaling downstream of rig eye and MAVs. Uh, IRF3's phosphorylated downstream of MAVs when rig eye is activated. And you don't see a decrease in this when you knock down trim 25. And when you overexpress trim 25, you don't see any change in 
phosphorylated IRF3 um, when in rigai wild type or knockout cells or knockdown cells when you compare it to when you don't overexpress trim 25. So Alan also did these experiments with riplet knockdown as well, um, and I'll, ju I'll just go over it quickly because they're pretty similar. But as you would expect for a critical regulator of rig eye, um, it behaves similarly to rig eye knockdown itself. So when you knock down rig eye or riplet, you get a significant increase in viral titer and, uh, and a loss of interferon beta and interferon lambda. And when you overexpress riplet, you interestingly get an uh, increase in both lambda and beta, as well as a corresponding decrease in viral titer. And these blots just show knockdown efficiency and loss of signaling downstream of rig eye, as well as overexpression leading to an increase in signaling downstream of rig eye. So rig eye has been shown to be activated to different magnitudes um, and in different ways depending on the virus that is infecting the cells. And also different viruses are able to inhibit the host innate immune system in different ways. So I wanted to look at different rig eye specific viruses as well as rig eye ligands more generally to see if trim 25 if there was any situation trim 25 was important for rig eye signaling and in none of the conditions i looked at i saw this so i'll just go over the data now where this is these are cells infected with x31 which is an h3n2 influenza a virus um, as well as sendi virus which is the traditional rig eye virus used uh, widely in the rig eye literature and you can see that when you knock out rig eye, you get loss of, of phosphor, uh, phosphorylation of STAT1. Um, and you can see the nice deletion of rig eye. And, what, uh, and that's the same with both X31 and SENDI virus. And then when you knock out TRIM25, you don't see this. And if anything, it looks like there's maybe even a slight increase in uh, interferon signaling in the TRIM25 knockouts. So interestingly, in the riplet knockouts, you don't get a complete loss of phosphostat one. And this maybe suggests there's some cases where riplet isn't absolutely required for rig eye signaling, but more experiments sort of need to be done to, show, to investigate this further. I also looked at a virulent strain of H1N1. So this PDM09 is from the epidemic uh, in California in 2009 as well as an influenza B virus. And once again, in the rig eye and riplet knockouts, you see this dramatic loss of phosphostat one, whereas in the trim 25 knockouts, you don't see this. Um, I also stimulated these cells with a number of rig eye specific RNA ligands. So the ones I used was a short 5' triphosphate RNA, which is sort of the traditional commercially available rig eye ligands. I used low and high molecular weight poly-IC, which is a synthetic ligand that activates rig eye-like receptors as well as TLRs, um, with low molecular weight poly-IC being meant to be more rig eye specific. And I also used um, this 5' triphosphate M7 double-stranded RNA ligand, which was published to be a really robust activator of rig eye. And we made this in-house. And that's actually what I saw. Um, I used it at sort of thousand-fold lower concentrations compared to the short 5' triphosphate RNA. And you can, so you can see here that all of these ligands are rig eye specific. Um, and when you knock, down, knock out rig eye, you lose phosphorylation of STAT1. Um, and this is kind of interesting for the poly-ICs and shows that maybe in these A549 cells they have deficient uh, TLR or MDA5 signaling. Um, you can see that riplet knockout, you also get a loss of phosphostat one, whereas trim 25 knockouts, you don't see this at all. Um, and once again, maybe in the short 5' triphosphate RNA, there's an increase in phosphorylation of stat one. 
So recently, a uh, paper that's been accepted for publication has um, supported and in some cases mirrored our findings. And this paper is on, was on Ripplet, or is on Ripplet, showing both ubiquitin and dependent and independent roles in rig eye signaling. And what they showed was that Ripplet's able to assist rig eye um, forming uh, oligomerizing along RNA as you increase RNA ligand size, uh, resulting in an increase in antiviral response. But sort of more importantly and relevant to what I was exactly working on, their first figure showed that Ripplet and not Trim25 ubiquitinates rig eye for antiviral signaling. And they used CRISPR-Cas9 and 293T cells in this experiment, and they showed that after sendivirus infection, you lose detection of interferon beta mRNA as detected by uh, qPCR in the Ripplet knockouts, but not in the Trim25 knockouts. And I think quite nicely they also showed that Ripplet and not Trim25 ubiquitinates rig eye, so they overexpressed Ripplet as, and Trim25 along with E2 ligases and double-stranded RNA ligands and showed ubiquitinated rig eye in the Ripplet condition but not the Trim25 condition. However, this is maybe a little bit surprising because um, it's been pretty well established in the literature that overexpression of Trim25 can ubiquitinate rig eye. So what we've shown sort of in this part of the talk is that in human cells, trim 25 deletion does not impair the rig eye antiviral response. Um, and this is contrary to over 10 years worth of established literature. And, but it's consistent across multiple labs and in multiple cell types. And we've also shown that in most conditions, Ripplet is absolutely required for rig eye function. So I'd just like to change tact a little bit for the last part of my talk and talk about uh, Trim25 knockout mice. So there's been very little work done in Trim25 knockout mice and none, uh, no experiments done in the context of a viral infection. So this is from the original paper that described Trim25 as estrogen responsive finger protein and they showed that knockout of Trim25 led to uh, underdeveloped uterus and the corresponding decrease in uterine wet weight. More recently, uh, a paper has shown a rig eye independent role for Trim25 in type 1 interferon responses. So they used a model for cerebral malaria where they infected the mice with Plasmodium virgi. Um, and in this model, mice succumbed to uh, excessive inflammation. And Trim25 knockout mice are partially rescued when compared to wild type. And this is uh, completely IRF3 dependent and completely MAVs and therefore rig eye independent. So we wanted to look at Trim25 knockouts in the context of a viral infection and we obtained mice from the European Mouse Mutant Cell Repository that contained a Trim25 allele with exon 4 flanked by LOX-P. Um, and these were crossed to a deleter strain containing a Cre recombinase under a ubiquitous promoter. And this is uh, genotyping for the deletion of exon 4. And exon 4 is quite small, and I really wanted to have a look at what we thought this deletion would do to the protein. And what I've shown here is a structure of the human trim 25 coil coil dimer with exon 4 highlighted in green. And it, it forms this folded linker region that's intimately associated with the, the um, coil coil dimer. I, I then used some sequence uh, alignments of the protein to map these structures onto the mouse, uh, Trim25 mouse open reading frame, and have highlighted that once again, exon 4 uh, is in this folded linker region. And what we, we sort of expect 
is that deletion of this will cause disruption of the protein leading to non-functional TRIM25. Although I don't have a TRIM25 specific antibody in uh, for mice, so I haven't been able to actually look at protein levels. So one thing our reviewers asked us to do was directly replicate the original finding in TRIM25 knockout MEFs. Um, so Sandra came into the lab and made some MEFs for me to do some experiments in, and I infected them with Sendi virus. And you can see that TRIM25 knockouts don't have any um, loss of interferon beta when compared to wild type. And I'll just pull up the original, the original finding here. Um, I just want to note quickly, I wasn't able to exactly replicate this experiment because they didn't actually publish any methods for their Sendi virus infection in this paper. So we wanted to look at in vivo infection of these mice. So Tanya did a influenza viral infection, um, which was an intranasal administration of virus to the, the mice and collected and homogenized lungs at day one and day three post-infection um, to look at the effect on the innate immune response. And kind of interestingly, what we saw is that uh, Michelle, Michelle Tate did the plaque assays for us, and what we saw was that at both day one and day three, we see an increase in PR8 in the knockout mice compared to the wild type. We also, uh, I'd just like to mention, it is very subtle. Um, and we also saw a very subtle decrease in interferon beta levels. So it's not really clear whether this is rig eye dependent or not, because we haven't actually looked specifically at mouse epithelial cells. Um, so there may be some sort of cell type difference that's occurring um, where TRIM25 can have an effect on rig eye. But there's also a chance that it's a non rig eye dependent effect on, on antiviral immunity. So this is very preliminary data, but I just wanted to put it in here. We collaborated with the Pellegrini lab, and Cody did an experiment in these mice to it using dengue virus. And the innate immune system is really important for control of dengue virus. Um, however, both rig like receptors as well as TLRs and also cyclic GMP AMP synthases have been shown to contribute to this immune response. So Cody infected these mice intravenously and collected, uh, and this is a qPCR done uh, that I did with the help of Wasan on serum collected at day three. So mice are actually able to really robustly clear dengue virus. Um, and much of the work with dengue is done in interferon receptor knockouts. And you can see that they have uh, a nice detection of virus by qPCR. And interestingly, our TRIM25 knockouts, were uh, you were also able to detect the dengue virus in our TRIM25 knockouts. Once again, showing that TRIM25 does seem to have a role in antiviral immunity. So I think what we've shown is that Riplet is essential for robust rig eye function and that in human epithelial cells and MEFs, TRIM25 deletion does not impair the rig eye antiviral response, uh, contrary to what's been published before. And this is consistent across multiple labs and in multiple cell types. I think there's a chance that TRIM25 has a cell type or species specific difference um, where it's required for rig eye dependent antiviral immunity and more ex experiments, for instance, in uh, TRIM25 rig eye double knockout mice are sort of required to further interrogate this or in mouse lung epithelial cells. I think what may be more likely, though, is that TRIM25 has a rig eye independent role in antiviral immunity. 
So I've got a bit of time left, actually, so I've got a lot of time to thank all these people, um, as there are a lot of people that helped me through the course of this project. In particular, I want to say a massive thank you to Sandra and Nick, who have been really great mentors throughout the course of my PhD. Um, and I think they're both exemplary scientists, and I've been really impressed by the thorough, um, intelligent, and sort of collaborative way that they approach their science. I'd also like to thank my other supervisors and my committee members, Nadia, Seth, Mark, and James, who have all been involved in my project to some extent, either providing reagents or advice or helping with experiments. The, the rest of the Nicholson lab have uh, been a great help throughout the course of my PhD. Um, sadly, it's getting a little bit smaller, but um, particularly Tanya has helped a lot with a lot of the experiments uh, and genotyping and uh, qPCR that I've had to do. Laura in proteomics was a massive help with all the um, mass spectrometry I did, and I did a lot more mass spectrometry experiments that I haven't presented today. And of course, Alan um, from the Hansbro group did some really critical experiments in the minimally immortalized cells. I'd like to really give a big thanks to Django and Phil of the soon to be X6 West Protein Lab. They've been constant fun and a wealth of knowledge throughout my PhD. And it's always been great to go up to sixth floor and have a chat with them. Um, I'd like to thank Cody and Wasan from the Pellegrini Lab for their help with dengue virus experiments that I've done. Michelle um, for providing some viruses for me to use. Paul Baker was a great help when I first started doing CRISPR. He sort of almost pioneered CRISPR-Cas9 in the inflammation division and helped me throughout all those initial cell lines when I was making them. Gabrielle has provided a lot of information to me about viruses and also provided pretty much all of the influenza A virus that I've used throughout my project. Um, also, the animal facilities for their help with the mouse work, and Catherine from the University of Melbourne for providing um, some of the other viruses I used. Michelle did all our plaque assays, and we have also had collaborators at the German Cancer Research Centre who have been collaborating with us on our paper. Um, I'd also like to thank Sue and Keely for the wonderful work they do here, as well as Madhu and Fegan and Rosie and Betty, um, because they sort of help keep this institute chugging al along at a really amazing rate. Um, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the family and friends that have really helped me through this. Um, I've been super lucky to have a close group of friends, an amazing girlfriend, and an, uh, amazing parents, and also to my funding bodies. Thank you. I must have been convincing. So, um, have you contemplated doing RNA seq, which presumably would be more sensitive than proteomics in trying to identify what the Trim25 antiviral response might might be? So, we did contemplate it initiate, uh, initially, but because most of the work I was doing with was with protein, we didn't really go down that route. But it is uh, quite a good suggestion. Trim25 doesn't interact with Rigai at all, or do you think that perhaps Trim25 needs Riplet to modify Rigai and then in some way enhances polymerization or something? 
So, I mean, overexpression of Trim25 and RigEye together, you can do co-IPs. Um, I guess it is a possibility. I have done work in Ripplet Trim25 double knockouts, but it's a little bit hard because Ripplet's absolutely required and you get an absolute phenotype. Um, I, I'm, I'm not really, I, I, don't, I don't really think that endogenously it does, and I haven't seen any evidence for an endogenous interaction. And I was never able to get recombinant protein, recombinant Trim25 and Rigai to interact with one another. So um, I may have missed something when you were explaining how Triplet is proposed to work, uh, as in it's proposed to ubiquitinate. Is that ubiquitination on Rigai's Activating, I think you sort of showed it somewhere else that said it stabilizes the organisms. Yeah, so, so that's from the recent paper that's in press. It's um, not so clear. It ubiquitinates the C terminal domain, um, in it, that's been shown, but it hasn't been looked at in the depth that Trim25 has been looked at. So specific residues have been looked at for Trim25. Um, Is the ubiquitination dependent on? Viral activation of rigor, or yes, yes. So you don't get, so you never have ubiquitination without the double stranded RNA there. No, no, you don't seem to. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if anyone's mutated residues in those in, in rigor. Is that what's been done? There have been mutated lysines in that. Yeah. Uh, what, what, can you repeat the question again? So if you, not, if you mutate the lysine residues that you implemented in rigor, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Talking about sort of the um, the role of um, Trim25 in the literature, you cited both overexpression and use of rig eye reporters with a sort of minimized rig eye mm. as potential sources of spurious results. So, um, have you tested any of your knockout, like your CRISPR knockout ones, um, with those minimized reporters to see if you can sort of tease out? how much of the published data using that reporter system is good and So I did make knockout 293T cells, which is sort of what all the reporter systems have been done in. And you do get a specific enhancement of rig eye signaling from the overexpression. I haven't used uh, overexpression reporter systems in the A549 cells, uh, they're a bit harder to transfect. You get quite a low transfection efficiency. But I have overexpressed Trim25, and it does enhance um, interferon responses. In one of your introductory slides, I saw that you had um, in the upstream signaling pathway, you had a ball for linear ubiquitination by the Lubac complex. So did you have an opportunity to look in Hoyle or Hoyt knockout MEFs whether there was a, diff um, a defect in rig eye activation? No, I, I didn't get the chance to look at that secondary layer of regulation because I was sort of initially trying to figure out what was wrong with the experiments for Trim25 and then it led me down the path looking at the knockouts with a range of different ligands. But it, it, it is sort of a good point. The initial paper looking at Lubac used overexpression systems to look at its um, activate, uh, impact on this pathway. Might be worth looking into it again, because there are a couple of reports that the uh, oil and oil knockout mice might have phenotypes that could be explained by excessive type 1 interferon signaling. Mm. Yeah, great talk, Tom. Um, coming back, I suppose, to Mark's point, 
I mean, you've got a phenotype in the mice and you've got a proteomic data set there. We're potentially, you know, assuming that uh, the loss of TRIM25, there's some substrate that, that's upregulated. Is there any candidates there at the protein level that could account for the difference in the, in the mice? Not that I really saw. There were sort of, um, there were a few proteins detected, but we also didn't see any change in viral levels in the TRIM25 knockouts in the A549 cells. So I'm not even sure if that would be the system that you would use to look for that. There was um, a couple of proteins. I did some co-IP mass spec with TRIM25. There were a couple of antiviral proteins that sort of haven't really been described extensively that were detected. Um, so potentially, yes, there, there is some scope there to look at that.